Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we'll be discussing the media war against Israel where so much of our mainstream media are showing bias towards Israel, particularly as Israel's fighting for a life against Hamas in Gaza. And we'll also be addressing the issue of the plight of Jewish students on campus with the rise of Jew hatred and the pro-Palestinian protests. Warm welcome to the program and today's special guest is all the way from Scotland. Her name is Christina Jones. She is the Communications Associate for Camera UK. Christina, warm welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me today, Simon. It's a pleasure. And um, Christina, um, you are a leading light in your generation and um, you know, well done for the pioneering work you've done in, in terms of Christian advocacy for Israel. Um, and we'll be going through your um, very uh, impressive uh, CV later, but you've, you've worked at the Israeli Embassy in the Public Affairs Department. You've worked uh, as a representative for the Israeli Embassy up in Scotland. Uh, and now you're working for Camera in terms of doing student outreach as well as monitoring uh, media bias from our mainstream media. So you've packed a lot in to a very a few years. But um, share with us something about your Canadian heritage and uh, how your parents came to um, Scotland. Well, thank you firstly for that fantastic introduction. I probably wouldn't say all that nice kind words about myself, but it means a lot. Thank you. Um, my Canadian heritage. Well, my parents actually came to the UK. How old am I now? Okay, I have to do all of these, do the math in my head, but they've been in the UK for about 36 years. My grandfather's actually from Ealing and my family, we have connections to Scotland as well. My grandmother is a first generation born in Canada um, and my parents actually ended up coming back here to, so my dad could actually fly planes effectively. And um, my parents have been here, they were meant to be here on a three-year contract and I guess God uh, God had humour for them as you like to put it and they've been here 36 years so yes and uh, so that's why I have a funny accent for your viewers that goes between Scottish and very Canadian at points as well. Very cool and I spoke to your dad on the phone he, he's a <laughs> lovely guy uh, and um, Christina share with us as well how you came to faith in, in Yeshua and, and when did the Lord give you a real love and a passion for Israel and the Jewish people? So that's a twofold uh, answer I guess for that one so I was very young when I came to faith, actually. I grew up in a believing household, so I'm very thankful for that, and a very Zionist house, uh, household. Um, and I'll share a little bit about my history as well with that later. But really, um, four years old, very m minor understanding of what God was and you know salvation. And honestly, I think it was just the fear of not going to heaven with my parents. I think that's really what kind of like spearheaded me from Bible, like from, um, uh, Sunday school and so you know I accepted the Lord then um, I remember it my parents were with me I was in the car we were passing Tesco I, I still see it today um, so yes some people may question that whether I did understand that um, then but I recommitted my life when I was 16 and um, when I came that was in and around the time actually when I first fell in love with Israel um, the first time I went to Israel when I, during the, oh goodness, I always get the, the wars all, always kind of like all the happening a bit confused, but during the second infatada, um, so it kind of coordinated with all of that, but um, yeah, so I grew up in a Zionist household as I said, but my family history, if you want to know a little bit about that, is my great-grandfather was actually a personal friend of Lloyd George, pre-Balfour, so as you can imagine, we would have he must he must have had conversations about Israel and the Jewish people um, and he also would most likely would have known Chaim Weizmann due to the work that he did for then it was called the Ministry of Munitions uh, he actually ran a munitions factory in the south south of uh, London in Southwark um, if I'm getting my geography correct so he must have known him as well during there must have been some overlap too um, fast forward a little bit too my great uh, my grandfather actually was in Italy during the war for four years and two memories I always have growing up as a child from my grandfather was first um, 
are you going to heaven as any good grandfather or Christian grandparent would make sure. Um, and the second one was always stand up for the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. And he was saying this from such a young age to me, um, four years old again, I remember this vividly. And I remember like as a little child going to my father, like who are these Jews? What is Israel? You know, children don't see anything beyond their parents. They don't understand race, gender, sex, anything like that, or even religion to some extent. Um, and so my dad was just like, don't worry, we'll, we'll teach you in time. Just listen to your grandfather. To, um, and then eventually my parents actually took me on our first pilgrimage to Israel when I was 15, 16. And uh, it really made sense to me and how I got involved in this, this crazy world, as I like to call it. It is a crazy world, but I'm so pleased you did as well. I mean, Thank that's you. an incredible family heritage you got there as well, uh, particularly knowing that uh, Haim Wiseman saved the British war effort during the uh, First World War. Uh, absolutely incredible story. So, and Lloyd George, of course, was the Prime Minister when the famous Balfour mm -hmm. Declaration was signed as well, as well as the San Remo Treaty. Um, but um, share with us uh, your experience, of, as not many people I get the opportunity to interview that have actually studied in uh, Tel Aviv, which is a nice university, very close to the main train link uh, there as well. So share with us what it was like to study in, uh, in Israel, to study in, in, in Tel Aviv, and, and um, what did you learn from your time? And what did you study more importantly? So I studied archeology span and history, but specifically biblical archeology, span which makes sense in Israel, you know, you can't go to study history and archeology span without doing that. Um, I actually did that for both my bachelor's and my master's as well. Um, so when I was at Glasgow University, I did archeology span too. Um, what was my time like there? It was very interesting actually because by the time I finished my first year, I was there during the 2014 uh, situation with Gaza then. So I was actually excavating about 25 kilometers or so from Gaza as well. Uh, so I got to see and experience the whole other side of Israel that you know going into that situation that it could be a possibility that you're gonna have to run to uh, bomb shelters or everything. Uh, but did I fully understand it? I'm not entirely sure. I did like really make a stance then that I was going to be like firm and I wasn't going to leave when anything arose that was dangerous. Um, so yes, it was fun to some extent, but also very informative and um, impactful as well. And um, I'm very thankful for my time there though, but overall it was fantastic though. Other than that, um, you know, it was very fun to study in Israel and live there. And, you know, I learned to speak Hebrew, um, as well, so I t made sure I was like, if I'm going to live here, I'm going to have to make sure and to speak Hebrew and read it and write it. And I ended up actually being there for three and a half years doing my master's. And actually, my master's thesis is on um, Tel Azika, which is mentioned throughout First Samuel and Sec First Samuel, Second Samuel, if I get my Bible correct again, Tel Azika. Um, and just looking at the top um, from the Tel down and below is the Valley of the Ela, where um, David and Goliath took place. Amazing. So that, I was looking out to that the whole time. That's <laughs> near Shiloh and that whole area yep, of uh, exactly. scenario. Excellent. And um, uh, uh, Christina as well. And, th and then from there, you uh, ended up working for the public affairs department. So a born again, Bible believing Christian uh, working in the Israeli embassy in London. Pretty much unheard of. Um, so share with us how the Lord opened that door for you and, and what was your time like uh, working for the Israeli embassy? And, and we have to especially acknowledge uh, Vivian Eisen, your, your boss then, the public affairs director. So she's a good friend of mine and the, one of the most warmest, friendliest Israeli diplomats that I've ever met. And I loved interviewing her and, and also her daughter as well, who, who served in the IDF as well at the time. Well, uh, thank you. Um, well, that's how we originally met, actually, was through the, the work that I was doing there at the embassy at the time. And I remember specifically sitting in this um, in this interview as well, listening to her and you interviewing her. Um, and I thoroughly miss working with Phoebe. I will put that out there. She has been, she was fantastic to work with and always a great fun and laugh to have as well, but very, a very impactful woman as well to learn a lot. And that's, I have a lot to owe and thank her too. My time at the embassy. Yes, I actually, I believe I was the first one really in a public, facing role within the embassy. Mostly people who were Christians were more like admin roles at the time. I was the one that was mostly, um, as you said, within the public diplomacy department. So really out there and known, and it came around quite quickly that there was actually a, a, 
evangelical Christian working within the embassy and I specifically was actually hired not by Vivi but actually her, her um, predecessor Alad Ratzon who was wanting specifically an evangelical Christian at the time to really harness and work with the relationships and build the relationships between the community and the evangelical community but also the other wider faith communities as well as what I dealt with and um, my time there was fantastic. Uh, you know, I ended up then going to work for them in Scotland, as you pr mentioned briefly earlier, and basically um, running all their operations as well in Scotland and their engagement there too. But I just would have I believed that I ended up would have ended up there? No, but really was God actually leading me um, when I came back from Israel after you know three and a half years of living there? I was you know. I'm more than happy to say this. I was fine with it. I was happy being supportive of Israel. I was never going to, if anyone I knew faced anti Semitism, I'd stand up for them. But really, I was exhausted. I was tired. I didn't really want to be involved in this world. But everything in my personal life brought me back to Israel in some capacity. So I battled with God and um, what I was going to do as a career path for quite some time because I was. Uh, I studied archaeology for almost like eight years by this point, you know, I was I was like, I'm going to do a, a job in heritage or archaeology or history or something. Um, and as I said, everything brought me back. And eventually I was just like, after six months, I worked at the airport during this time just to get some income to, you know, support myself and pay my, pay my rent to my parents. Um, but then I fin finally just gave in. I was like, fine, I'll apply to the embassy. And within three days, I heard back from them and they were like, we've got this position, would you be interested? And I was like, well, I, I mean, I guess, like, <laughs> yeah, let's go for it. And I've not looked back since and really like, you know, that term and phrase that people say is God has humor. Like it really wasn't something I wanted to do, but I had to go through all of that as well to realize like this is actually what I want to do and go through that learning process as well. Yeah, I'm sure that your uh, interest and passion in archaeology won't, won't be wasted. So um, and it's fascinating actually um, visiting the archaeological sites because as part of the uh, Christian Media Summit in uh, 2019, so they took us to an archaeological site just on the outskirts of Jerusalem where we were shifting through like coins belonging to the Second Temple era and stuff as well. And it really does feel like you've got literally history um, in your hands. Um, so yeah, I can see the interest and the fascination in archaeology, but I think you're doing a much more important role now in defending Israel and building those key strategic relationships with the Israeli government and with the Jewish community. But um, share with us your, your current role. So you're currently with uh, Camera. Explain to us who Camera are and your role with it within Camera and what they actually do. Sure, so CAMERA stands for the Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting and Analysis. We were founded in 1982 following the first Lebanon war where it was noted there was a need for more ac someone to combat the misinformation within the media um, because there was a lot of inaccurate information about Israel in the media at the time going around. So since then, we've been around then, we've now developed into several departments. So I'm here in the UK, there's an Israeli department and the main office is actually in Boston. And we also undertake research and monitor media in Spanish, English, Hebrew and Arabic. So we're covering quite a few bases there. And we've since developed into other departments. We have a Christian department, we have an education department, and we also have a campus department. Um, in the UK uh, right now, what I'm working on is I actually have a very interesting role within camera. I'm the only employee that they have that actually works within several departments um, and uh, hopefully uh, things will be a bit more consolidated shortly. But I work for the research team in terms of monitoring Scottish media and helping ensure, you know, what's to report back what's happening in that and how we can combat the misinformation. I'm also overseeing the campus department that we have here in the UK, so working with stu our students. And I also work with the Christian department. So kind of similarly what I did at the embassy, engaging that with the various Christian communities and um, fighting you know, this misinformation within the church about Israel as well. Excellent. And, and um, Christina, show us what the political climate's like in, in Scotland in terms of Israel, because, uh, um, you know, I, I love Scotland. It's a, it's a beautiful country with beautiful people um, and some real people that really love Israel in a powerful way, particularly all the Scottish regional groups that were formed after Israel's last major confrontation with Hamas in Gaza, as you say, back in 2014. So I had the opportunity to speak in, 
Edinburgh, Glasgow, and uh, one of my favourites up in the Highlands uh, in Inverness. But um, also we know there's an incredible amount of hostility towards Israel as well. Share with us what it's like now in terms of Israel advocacy. In terms of Israel advocacy, I'm not as involved in that as what I was once, but in terms of the political climate, um, we are seeing, I mean, it gets worse every day, in my opinion, in terms of what's coming out regarding Israel. Um, but I know the former First Minister now, uh, Hamza Youssef, is very supportive of you know, the, Gaza, the Gazan cause and everything. And I know um, in terms of, you really also have to understand the um, sectarianism in Scotland. You also have to understand the wider social background of Scotland to really understand how bad it is actually. And I would say Scotland in general and has been for quite some time, the worst place for the Jewish community to be living and also just any Zionist as well because um, there is this rhetoric that you see within the, the within wider society there is that and this nationalist identity that they draw upon is they themselves see themselves as oppressed like the Palestinian people um, also you know they use that within the football but they so anyone who's more from the it's a very complicated issue actually um, so they see themselves oppressed as I said by the English um, so they have that affinity with the Palestinian cause and not necessarily the Israelis the Israelis are the English in this example um, and then it feeds over into the soccer or football for those who coin it here in the UK. Um, it becomes a very sectarian issue. You mean the Celtic Rangers? Yes, yeah, Celtic and Rangers. So if you're, you're Celtic, you tend to be Catholic, you tend to be separatists, you tend to support the Palestinian wider cause in that way. If you're Protestant, you're, um, you're a unionist, you support the Israelis and that. So there's a, it's a very multifaceted issue. Um, but in terms of being someone who's Jewish and a Zionist up there, I am worried for them because the community is small as is, and they have been leaving for some time, um, even before, you know, the most recent with October 7th and how bad it's gotten. And now we're seeing wider issues within the UK in terms of campuses. And I mean, yesterday, I believe there was a, within the media and the news, it was reported that three individuals were arrested for a plot against the Jewish community. Now that was um, a terrorist attack plot against the community here in London. Um, but we're seeing like how bad it's getting for the community and it's only in time that it's going to affect them more and more in Scotland as well. And uh, um, yeah, it's not, it's not a great situation there, in my opinion. No, but it's you've got great people up there like Sammy Stein yes. and Glasgow Friends of Israel and others um, that are doing a, a very good work in, in getting into the streets and conveying the truth of Israel and the righteousness of Israel's cause. I'm um, going back to your work with, 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 with camera. Can you just give an example of what is effectively kind of media bias against Israel? So media bias is any form of misinformation about Israel. So it can be something so, and I say with the quotations, minor. I don't think anything is minor. Um, but for example, just when I actually started the camera back in 2022, uh, there was an example where we were discussing about how many times uh, BBC Arabic actually said that Tel Aviv is the capital of Israel, for example. So we deal with minor things like that. And when I say minor, again, I reiterate, like, you know, it's still a major issue, but that show, but this shows you the degree of issues that we deal with. And most recently as well, we've been seeing too, in terms of like um, Rafa, we were help, like, you know, fighting all that misinformation and saying like, and highlighting, you know, within the wider reporting, you know, this is all inaccurate, this is not appropriate, you know. Um, so it, can, it varies from day to day and what's actually happening within the media, or we also have been highlighting anti-Semitism too. So when the Guardian posted that, you know, anti-Semitism um, a cartoon and forgive me I've forgotten his name that was a couple months ago um, we actually then republished some of the stuff that we've actually done on this individual who has a history of anti-semitism as well and feeding into this rhetoric of anti-zionism as well um, so it varies day to day in what we're dealing with but anything that's misinformation against Israel or Zionism in general is what we deal with. And Christina, share with us why it's so important to confront media bias, um, particularly when it comes to Israel, and why is it so dangerous that some, uh, whether it's the uh, kind of broadsheets or the tabloids, or, or whether it's actually the TV broadcasters, when they report on Israel, 
and they get their facts wrong. Why is it so important to um, really uh, acknowledge the fact and approach the journalist, approach the news producers, say, look, that report or that article was inaccurate? Why is it so dangerous that when it comes to reporting on the Middle East that uh, journalists get their facts right? Why is it important? Because why, I think the question is, why is Israel always held to a different standard than any other nation that we see consistently day to day? We don't see this kind of hatred or vilification of any other nation in the world. Um, you know, we, for example, when it came to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, we were seeing, like, they were ensuring that the accurate information was there. Why is it we always have to, also with journalists, and when it comes to the, specifically the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and more so now with the Israeli-Hamas conflict, why there's so much misinformation? Why are journalists being allowed to give their opinions? Why are they also accepting figures from Hamas, which are a known terrorist organization? And was it yesterday or the day before the UN just came out and slashed the numbers of deaths? without even giving a wider, you know, not releasing it to the media. It's just now on their website from what I understand. So I think it's important that we need to do this because no other nation, especially from a Christian perspective, we're told to stand with the nation of Israel and God's people. A simple that verses, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And I firmly believe that um, as well. And we don't, as I said, we don't see it with anybody else. And I think we should be, you know, holding journalists and media outlets to their journalistic standards. They're meant to come with no bias, but seemingly they do when it comes to this conflict um, and are purporting spreading lies consistently. So I hope that answers your question. No, no, it does very well. So let's have a look at uh, Camera in Action. And this is their work to expose the work of uh, France 24 regarding their coverage of Israel.
So that shows us uh, some of the impressive work are being done by a camera to hold a big multimedia corporations to account regarding their coverage of Israel and uh, the Jewish people. Now, obviously, as a journalist, I have a, a different perspective when it comes to kind of media bias and uh, accuracy of reporting and knowing why journalists report in such a way and you have a complete different contrast of views if you have a journalist writing for the Telegraph, for example, or the Times or the Mail, uh, compared to a journalist who works for the Independent or the Guardian. They have to work within the ideological framework of the newspaper, but obviously the broadcasters, that's that's has the biggest influence over the over the public because people will switch on watch a bit of news watch a very small news item uh, on our mainstream media about the conflict and then it's completely taken out context and of uh, course what's so powerful about broadcasting is the fact that if you uh, if you read a newspaper you look at the writing and your brain engages with the words and then you process what's been written if you listen to a radio report, you listen to what's being said and then your brain processes it. But when you see a TV news report on Israel, your eyes tell you, uh, tell your brain what is what your eyes see. So you don't process that information so much and that's why it's all about emotional intelligence. You look at something, you end up instantly having an emotional response to what you've seen. Of course, Israel was presented in so many cases in such a negative light that this is why Israel, in a sense, loses public opinion and support around the world. But, but share with us as we have to discuss media bias, but we have to put it in the context of October the 7th and what's happened there. Share with us where you were, uh, Christina, on that awful day and how did you first become aware of the absolute horrors that were unfolding in southern Israel on that day? I mean, I th think I'm going to for remember that day for quite some time. I actually was blissfully asleep. Um, and then all of a sudden, my dad runs in, banging it up on my door, and I'm like, what's going on? And all he says to me is, Israel's been invaded. And I was just like, I'm like, oh, goodness, OK, what? So I jump up out of my bed, and then I'm like, because all, that's all he said to me. And then so I run downstairs, and I'm like, OK, what's happening? completely like in shock as well. I don't even know what time it was by this point. It must have been maybe 10 or 11. Um, and just sheer horror, because it was coming out what was happening, like slowly coming out what was happening. And you're just like, but how bad is it? Is it also from the north? Is it going to be, you know, is Jerusalem going to, something going to happen in Jerusalem? You know, all these thoughts. And then I'm like, oh my goodness, I have friends who live in and around this area. So I'm like messaging them like, hey, what's going on? Are you okay? Um, so that, yeah, I'm not going to forget that. And then instantly was right on my laptop monitoring what was coming out and, you know, um, to see like how I was actually monitoring the BBC at that point because my colleague needed help with that, Hadar Sela, who's our co-editor for Camera UK, um, to see, like, to monitor what they were saying because we knew it was going to come back and eventually there was going to be so much inaccurate information. Um, and I think I sat on my laptop probably for like 12 hours straight from that point. And then for the few days after that as well, I was consistently working like 12 hour days, just monitoring what was coming out because none of us could even, I think it was the only thing we could do to help and to really try and understand what was happening. Um, even though we didn't know what was happening and still didn't know if some of our friends were affected or not affected by the situation as well. So that's where, that's, that's how it started and what ended up for the next few days and weeks following as well. Yeah, and, and how has cameras work changed since October the 7th? Because obviously with October the 7th, um, Israel then became the focus of the international uh, media, uh, of journalists, of TV crews around the world reporting on what happened on October the 7th. Uh, and we've seen that focus shift from Russia's invasion of the Ukraine with the Russia-Ukraine war shift to, towards Israel. And uh, this is where we are. So we see that Israel now is currently at the center of the international uh, media circle um, in which we see uh, that Israel and the Jewish people uh, constantly in our news and there's news stories either about Israel or about instances of anti-Semitism near enough every day now in our newspapers uh, and in our news agenda. 
Well, the, our work hasn't shifted in the sense. Um, the shift is that we're over, we're overworked now. And we don't have the capacity, unfortunately, and that's why we rely on, you know, tips as well because we are a small team and we will miss things, and that's the unfortunate reality. So I encourage any of your viewers if they see anything that they think is inaccurate information. Um, to be in touch with us. Um, I believe later on you'll share the, the website that they can get in touch that way through my email address as well, it's on the website. Um, that's how we do it as well. So we rely, we actively monitor ourselves, but we also encourage individuals to help us because we are, we also are human as well and we will not see things. And it's not just the BBC, it's also the Guardian, the Independent, you know, um, Sky News, anything and everything. For example, today I was just made aware of a tip that, um, uh, BBC Radio 4, they had an individual who basically said Eurovision, um, the reason why Israel got so much was with the Zionist lobby and he was allowed to say this on BBC Radio 4 Scotland. Um, so, and that was a tip, so, you know, we can only do so much. So we're not just doing, you know, um, online print, but also if you see anything on the TV shows as well within like, for example, BBC, um, and send that through to us. And we will do our best to try and write a complaint, you know, based upon that once we assess it and see how we can work it within the wider the wider issues that we're dealing with in yeah. complaints. Because the problem that we, we face when it comes to kind of media coverage of Israel is that this war's not put in context. Mm -hmm. And it's not actually until you go to Israel and see the destruction caused by Hamas on October the 7th do you realise the magnitude of it. None of this was actually reported. Um, I mean, when, it, when the, the news broke of what's happening in Israel, I had to watch I-24 because I didn't trust any other kind of media outlet when it came to what was going on in Israel. And then you see the magnitude of it, but also then you see also the destruction uh, on what Hamas did as well was just beyond horrific. Um, I mean, this is the biggest massacre against the Jewish people since the Holocaust. So uh, you have to put everything in that context, but there isn't, that narrative has then shifted. Israel wins international uh, opinion, and uh, we see that we have, Israel has favor, favorable media reports after Israel's uh, attack so horrifically with the, with the murder of 1,200 people and uh, over 6,000 injured and many of those critical. And then, 250 hostages taken to Gaza um, and uh, what Hamas did on October 7th posed an existential threat uh, to Israel's existence and Israel's deterrent capabilities were shot to bits so you can understand the grief you can understand the pain but when you go to Israel you realize that the war is secondary what's more important is actually to get the hostages home and and sometimes our mainstream media don't actually convey the fact that Israel is a nation fighting for life. Israel is not in Europe. Israel is not in North America. Israel is in the Middle East. In the South, it has a genocidal terrorist organization, Hamas, sponsored by the Iranians that want to destroy her. The same with Hezbollah in the, in the North. You have Fatah and the Palestinian Authority, again, d want the destruction of the Jewish state, backed up by the Iranians and other extremists. It's not a friendly, safe neighborhood. Uh, and particularly when it comes to kind of reporting, it, it seems like they, the, our mainstream media want to focus on the, the narrative of focusing on the plight of the Palestinians in Gaza, but never actually hold Hamas to account. Why is it so dangerous that our mainstream media don't hold Hamas to account for their atrocities and actually report within that context? I think this is dangerous in general that they're not doing this because the wider Western society deems them as terrorists. That, like, you know, the UK government, um, Canada, I believe Australia as well have deemed them uh, as terrorists. And this fact that, you know, you had media outlets not calling them terrorists, they called them, what, I believe, freedom fighters at the time. BBC called them groups. Oh, groups. See, Everyone like had band. something. Yeah, a pop band or a rock band, they call groups. It's debatable, you know, like well, it's for them, I guess, pick and choose. Um, words really form also public opinion and ideology and understanding of when it comes to media coverage, but also understanding what is actually happening within a specific region. So if they're just hearing individuals, freedom fighters, you know, they're going to go to what their most recent example is, an understanding of that. Um, that is too. And so, the fact that we've not been calling them what they are is, well, firstly, it's against, it's a shame because it's what happened, it was a terrorist attack on people. Um, these were regular people who also were, from what I understand, a lot of them were very much involved in building relations between the Palestinian people and the Israelis as well. Um, 
and they were brutalized and murdered and we don't want to go into I won't even describe anything further um, but this ideology of trying to change and make them happy-go-luckies is beyond my own comprehension and does what does det um, what's the word it does like um, influence the way in which people will understand and go all further with this this um, conflict as well yeah because it's so emotionally driven yeah is that exactly if you uh, call them a group as you said a pop band like that's a that's a good you happy-go-lucky feel good thing that you understand um, people know what terrorism is and we associate that obviously with 9-11 so if we're not using that same rhetoric um, or words I mean sorry um, we don't we don't understand how the gravity and the situation and again people do not understand as well Hamas are funded by Iran who are in you know connected with uh, Lebanon who are also you know connected with China and Russia and um, all all of these other connections so they're not understanding also the wider geopolitical impact this is happening and how this will also um, you know potentially influence the Western world as well um, come who come who knows when but people it's a lack of education as well too unfortunately. Yeah, well I will say on, on air that Hamas is not only a genocidal terrorist organization it's also a death cult and not only wants the destruction of Israel and the eradication of the Jewish people worldwide, uh, worldwide, but also wants to see the destruction of the West placed by an extreme Islamic caliphate, very much like ISIS. Uh, and it's important to call it out. But let's have a look now at this um, excellent news report. This is 10 years old, but this is a former uh, Associated Press journalist speaking out about the bias within the Associated Press when it comes to Israel, particularly Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza. During the summer of 2014, Israel and Hamas fought for 50 days. Reporters from all over the globe covered the fighting, often filling their stories with conflicting information and questionable reporting. After the war, former AP reporter Mati Friedman wrote an article called An Insider's Guide to the Most Important Story on Earth. And I decided at the end of the summer to write an essay looking at what has gone wrong through the lens of my own experiences. For seven years, Friedman reported for the Associated Press, a giant news organization that provides information to many other media outlets around the world. He says the AP and the mainstream press suffer from two malfunctions. One, Israel gets too much coverage, and two, the press has taken sides. The mainstream press corps here has largely adopted an advocacy role. They've decided to play a political role in the conflict. Um, they've decided to lobby for the side that they think is right, and political decisions are disguised as journalistic decisions. Friedman says Hamas took advantage of the bias. The strategy is to terrorize Israeli civilians using rockets, provoke an Israeli response, put civilians in Gaza in between the Israelis and the Hamas fighters by uh, storing rockets in civilian basements, in the basements of mosques, in schools, and we've seen all those things documented this summer, and then having the huge international media contingent in Gaza film the civilian casualties, not the armed men, and use those pictures to spark outrage against Israel abroad. And that will prevent Israel from acting to the full extent of its strength against Hamas. That's the strategy I think any intelligent person can see it. And yet it's not covered like that. But the Associated Press refuted Friedman's claim. It issued a statement that said in part, his arguments have been filled with distortions, half-truths and inaccuracies, both about the recent Gaza war and more distant events. His suggestion of AP bias against Israel is false. The AP denies Friedman's claim that the AP and other media ignored or underreported Hamas firing from mosques, schools and UN facilities. But Friedman says the world is getting a skewed version of what actually is happening. The, the story is, if you read between the lines and if you read the lines themselves, the story is that Israel is faced with a clear moral choice and is making the wrong choice. Israel could have peace, but it chooses war. Um, that story is, is false. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Uh, the excellent uh, news report there put together by Chris Mitchell, but that is 10 years old, dating back to 2014. And you can see the current parallels with Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza now. Um, Christina, you also do a lot of work with Cameron in terms of uh, 
on campus with universities. Um, share with us what's happening on campus when it comes to Israel. And uh, of course, we've, we've seen the news reports. We've seen it in the United States at, at Columbia University in, uh, in New York, together now with Oxford and Cambridge, and now SOAS with these big protests against Israel. And of course, Jewish students are feeling increasingly unsafe. They felt unsafe prior to October the 7th, but now the kind of hatred against Israel and the Jewish people on campus is just escalated to a horrific level. Well, I don't even know where to begin because it's just been non-stop since um, October 7th, especially within the campus world, um, not just even within the media world. But the students that I've been dealing with, I first want to say that have I have such complete respect for them because what they're facing is not something I could have stood up against back when I was a student and I thought it was bad when I was a student and I actually got cyber bullied a little bit for my beliefs and opinions of Israel and it's nothing nothing what these kids are facing on a day-to-day -day basis and, and the resilience and their tenacity is something I completely admire. Um, it is not a safe environment for Jewish or Zionist students on campus. I mean if you put your head above the parapet you're gonna be victimized in some capacity. We're now seeing, you know, these encampments happening. Um, we're seeing, you know, the consistent weekly, there's like usually a weekly kind of like march around some uh, campuses, um, you know, f calling for the resistance, the infatata, genocide. The unfortunate reality is these individuals who are on, um, who claim to be pro-Palestinian are not pro-Palestinian. They don't understand what they're actually saying. Firstly, it doesn't help the Palestinian cause. Um, and they don't understand that it's actually, you know, effectively doing what Hamas called for and did on October 7th towards the, Israeli, the wider Israeli population. And I think they also don't recognize, you know, um, that Israel, I mean, 20% of the Israeli population is Israeli Arab as well. So they're also calling for their death and destruction, you know. But being Jewish on campuses, some of the students I'm face, like dealing with as well are terrified to show, to wear a Magan David or the Kippah, um, you know, because they're getting not just anti-Semitic comments as well, like their fear of, you know, being violently like hurt or harassed too. Um, and that's unacceptable. And unfortunately, the universities are not doing enough, in my opinion. We just saw last week um, Rishi Sunak, uh, Sunak meet with vice chancellors, I believe 20 from the top universities, to basically call them out on the anti-Semitism that's happening. I think the government were quite slow to do something about it. Um, the university, but it shouldn't have taken the government to step in either. The universities have, the, they have to look after their students, uh, just be, not just because of the Equality Act, um, but that they have a right um, to protect them. You know, it's part of their self-interest as well, and um, they're not doing enough. And we're seeing, you know, student unions coming out wanting to do boycotts against Israel, um, signing motions. Um, Student unions are separate from the universities themselves, but they are still connected and affiliated. And we're seeing some of the individuals within student unions calling for, you know, what I just said, resistance and not really understanding what resistance means. And we've already seen what resistance means from October 7th, um, according to, you know, the pro-Hamas pro side. Um, so it's not an environment, it's not conducive. And some of these kids are terrified that they may be reprimanded. Um, if they're not already being to some capacity, or they may not, they may have issues getting their degrees. They're fearful to say something in front of their peers, and even they're facing stuff from their own um, academics themselves. I've heard of academics basically saying, denying October 7th happened, the rape of women October 7th didn't happen, um, saying, you know, what happened to Israel is appropriate on October 7th, things like this. That is not. Firstly, not a welcoming environment for any student, um, especially a minority who are already been historically persecuted and more needs to be done. And do I have the answer to that? Unfortunately, I don't. Um, is it come too late now with the UK government to be stepping in finally? Yes, completely. We're now what's uh, more than six months after October 7th. It should have been happening. Safeguards should have been put in place instantly. Um, to protect these students because in any historical uh, conflict or rise with Israel and between uh, Israel and Gaza, there's always been seen a rise of anti-Semitism and perpetuating, you know, uh, this ideal, this idealism that, you know, all Jews represent Israel um, and that they have to be held to the accounts of the Israeli government. And so that's something, you know, has happened historically. So why the universities don't have something in place as well 
is also baffling to me. Yeah. But isn't one of the major problems when it comes to due hatred on campus, and, and this is considering that uh, our university students become the next generation of leaders in terms of business and politics and, and leading the, the nation, uh, and they will take on those positions of leadership in the country, and we're seeing that our university campuses are so toxic, so anti-Israel, um, that what we're having is the international definition of anti-Semitism is not being implemented. So it's not backed up by law. Um, universities have signed up to it, but they don't actually apply it because there's no law to actually enforce it. Um, and to know that if students, students don't feel safe on campus, then surely no one else is gonna feel safe on campus either because then it just becomes controlled and run by extremists who use the so-called Palestinian cause as a pretext for Islamicization. Um, and that's what's so toxic. Um, so share with us how it's so important that universities understand the uh, international definition of anti-Semitism and actually start implementing it, which is essentially calling, if you call Israel a racist state, that Israel has no right to exist, um, that uh, Zionism is a poisonous, dangerous ideology, then that is just 100% pure Jew hatred. I think it also comes to the fact that universities, there needs to be better education about explaining A, what anti-Semitism is um, with the wider society generally. Um, and I know there are organizations that do go around explaining what that is, but after they've done those training seminars, what are the universities actually doing to implement this as well to further protect students? Um, in terms of IRA, you know, the government, I do think are gonna have to do something at some point because we, we with, for some reason, anti-Semitism is not treated the same as any form of other discrimination in the country, especially when, it, like, you know, uh, within other minorities, we're not seeing this as well. Um, more needs to be done and, um, you know, again, it's, it's hard, you know. Uh, a lot of also universities have also adopted the Jerusalem Declaration as well, um, which again, if you really know what the Jerusalem Declaration is, it really undermines what IRA actually is. Um, so a lot of them kind of went around to circumvent it that way, to say like, you, like, you know, we, we've got this definition, Jerusalem's in the name, so we're not we're not anti is we're not anti Israel, we're not anti Jewish, but that's that's a complete farce. It's a, a way to get around to, to protect those who, in my opinion, who are you know anti Zionist, anti anti Semitic as well. Um, what were they going to do in the long term? Who knows? But they definitely need to be doing more to protect the Jewish students and Zionist students, students on campus. And um, I hope that does happen. But will it happen? I don't think it will because the we're too far gone now, and too many things have happened and. They've not done anything uh, practical, in my opinion. Some have actually done some stuff. Um, I mean, we saw in Harvard, I think university basically said, you know, um, if you hire anyone who's part of these protests or something at one point, they were like, we're, you, um, no, sorry, it was a law firm, I think, or something like that within the law department. If they found out they were from Harvard, they were no longer being employed. Um, it's a very complicated situation. I'm probably getting it confused, but there were ramifications in that sense. Um, but I do think, you know, these students are being radicalized too. Um, and what the long-term societal impact of that is as well is going to be interesting to see how that plays out and how it further fuels anti-Semitism in the years to come. So let's have a look and see uh, what happened recently uh, in the States at uh, Columbia University in New York. And now we're seeing this is happening on our own campuses across the UK, particularly at Oxford and Cambridge and also uh, SOAS University in London as well. On Columbia's campus, Jewish students endured threats with calls to go back to Poland. Here, a demonstrator points at pro-Israel students while holding a sign that reads, All Qassam's Next Targets. And a Jewish professor is denied entry to the campus while school officials look on. I am a professor here. I have every right to be everywhere on campus. You cannot let people that support Hamas on campus and me, a professor, not go on campus. Let me in now. Meanwhile, other Columbia faculty members join protesters chanting Free Palestine and calling for the school to divest from companies selling weapons to Israel. Demonstrations growing more radical have Jewish students fearing for their safety, leading one rabbi to tell students to stay away because the school can't protect them. 
I was there today and it, it made me sick hearing the things they were saying and doing. Um, so over this holiday, I kind of just want to try to avoid it as best as I can for my own safety. Monday, the school went to online classes only as New York Governor Kathy Hochul came to see the situation firsthand. Students are scared. They're afraid to walk on campus. They don't deserve that. But I've never seen a level of protest that is so person to person. It is so visceral. And I'm not calling on everyone. People need to find their humanity. Have the conversations. Talk to each other. Protests, however, spread to other schools in the Northeast. Monday night at NYU, police clashed with protesters while making arrests as they tore down a tent encampment. At Yale, police arrested 45 students for trespassing as their peers celebrated them as heroes. Pro-Palestinian students at MIT have declared part of their campus a liberated zone. While at Harvard, officials shut down Harvard Yard until Friday to prevent similar protests. The reaction is simply a horror. Rabbi Moisha Hauer told CBN News it needs to be stopped. It's been happening in one place after the other at different degrees. And if it's not addressed properly and efficiently, it will, it will continue to grow. If they're doing things which break the law, they should have consequences as defined by the, by the law. But they must have consequences. The answer can't be, we spoke to them. Monday, President Biden condemned the anti-Semitic protests while also condemning those he says don't understand what's going on with the Palestinians. Abigail Robertson, CBN News. And a hot uh, must go out to those uh, Jewish students on campus, both here and also in the United States, who fear for their own lives, they fear for their own safety, and uh, shouldn't be studying in that hateful environment that we're seeing, because we're seeing that the Palestinian cause is being used to uh, for Islamism and also for extremism, and we can't tolerate that. Uh, share with us your role at uh, on on campus. So, um, yeah, uh, share with us how you help to equip Jewish students, also Christian students, who are interested in standing with Israel and uh, and the Jewish people, particularly this very difficult time that Israel's at war against Hamas in Gaza. So we work with students in multiple ways. We actually have two main work streams that we work with students. So our first is through our fellowship, which is like more a robust way in which for individuals have a very well-founded understanding of the wider conflict, um, that they can partake in that. And it's uh, over the over an academic year, and we have different tracks that they can do to help focus on their strengths. So we have a writing track, a general track, and an events track. And basically, we, depending on what track they do, we get our students to hold events on Israel education, but also combating the misinformation on campus. And we also help uh, help them, you know, come up with ideas for topics and articles that in which they uh, are facing on campus at the time. Um, we also work with, uh, we also have a campus coalition, so it's working with Israel societies and supporting them and bolstering them up. So like helping them with funding in terms of um, uh, events, funding, speakers, materials, you know, whatever they need. Uh, but just generally since October 7th, my work has been crazy in terms of the different kind of support uh, that I've been giving students and basically helping them get legal advice or helping them, you know, in terms of if they have faced anti-Semitism or uh, anti-Zionism on campus, like how to go around that and, you know, to get the university or relevant organizations uh, who are working on uh, the complaint to help, you know, bolster up. But we also work um, further with, um, we also have our own campaigns actually to help students uh, combat this misinformation that they're facing on campus. So we have um, one that's called Mizrahi Week, which is usually in November each year about explaining what the plight of Mizrahi Jews and explaining their expulsion from Arab lands. You know, there's a lot of misinformation about that. People only think it's, um, you know, Palestinian refugees. We are actually, you know, changing this narrative and showing, you know, it's all, there are Jewish refugees as well, which people don't think, think there is. We also then, usually around Apartheid Week, we have Apartheid Week Exposed, um, which is combating the misinformation that students are facing during Israeli Apartheid Week on their campus. So from s certain issues, explaining what genocide is, explaining wider, you know, this rhetoric that Israelis are st stealing Palestinian land or water. We have a whole bunch of materials about this and combating that. And our last one is this is Zionism campaign, which is a campaign which is about basically explaining what Zionism is, where it comes from, from religious, social, political aspects, uh, political Zionism, 
and you know combating this narrative that Israel is a colonial colonial entity. Um, so we work in many ways with students, and it varies day to day what the student requires, as you can imagine. Uh, absolutely. So, um, Christina, share with us, or maybe give a message to any uh, Christian students watching this program, um, because this is an important one, that they have essentially a historic opportunity to stand with their fellow uh, Jewish students and do what you did and what I've done, and, and that's kind of pioneer uh, into the kind of uh, Jewish world and to show love and solidarity with Israel and, and the Jewish people. All I would say is I would encourage you, if you have a love for Israel and really take firm on what God is saying in his Bible and completely believe it is 100% truth and accuracy and authentic, you will support and you should naturally support Israel. And to do that as a student is a big thing. I won't say it's going to be easy. It's definitely, it definitely takes a lot of courage to do that. But I would really encourage you, and I've consistently seen blessing after blessing after blessing in my life uh, since I've stepped up for Israel. It hasn't come without issues, that's for sure, because it is a very, as you can imagine, Simon, you'll know and confirm, it's a very spiritual battle. But I, my most recent blessing is meeting my fiance, who has a heart for Israel as well. And I never believed I would find a partner um, who would, you know, support Israel the way I do. So I encourage, like, it, your blessings can come in many ways. I'm just giving one example for myself. But I would really encourage Christian students to really stand with their Jewish brothers and sisters, and you know, uh, take a stand for Israel. Uh, and finally, um, within 30 seconds, um, Christina, share with us how important it is to engage in the media to look at news reports, whether they are broadcast news reports, whether there are articles about Israel, uh, and support the work of, of camera to provide media accuracy, which is so important because truth really does matter. All I do is encourage you when you're looking at media sources to think of where the funding's coming from. Is there a bias already inherently from the outlet? Um, where's the journalist, their background, are, where are they getting their information from? Think about it critically, but when it comes to camera, there's many ways you can support us. You can support us by um, uh, you know, helping give tips, you can support us financially, or you can even just um, share the words and what we're doing in our articles as well. Excellent. Uh, Christina, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you yeah, on the Middle East Report me. today. Thank you. And I want to thank you for watching this program home. There's a huge battle that Israel faces, not only on the battlefront in Gaza against Hamas, but also in the media with uh, awful uh, biased news reports against Israel, which demonize Israel, make it, it makes it harder for Israel to have that moral reserve. And of course, we've also discussed the massive problem on our university campuses. As, as Christians, we can't afford to be silent during this time. It's time to speak up for Israel and the Jewish people and to pray for them. And I want to thank you for watching this week's edition of the Middle East Report.